Silo is muted to you. Shweta, you are muted. Okay, so I'm interested in the backstory of Punch Bros. Uh, where and when did it all begin? Uh, I know that you wrote some of it uh, during the pandemic, not all, but uh, substantial parts of it, um, but that you'd actually started working on it even prior to that. Uh, when did it actually come together? Uh, when did it start to feel like a collection to you? Uh, what were the questions and concerns that drove the writing? Uh, was there, for instance, a seed poem of some sort, a poem that was the first to write itself? Uh, actually, it was written, Sri Lanka, it was written completely, almost entirely before the pandemic. I mean, I worked towards uh, edits and so on in January, February, and March of 21. But the book really was written over 2019. And uh, it's intriguing that you should speak of seed poems because one of the, I mean, the original working title for the book was The Seed Catalogue. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to think about how poems could act as, uh, you know, some secular version of a bija mantra. I mean, how, is, how might it be possible for a poem to hold the kernel of uh, an entire trajectory of preoccupation that you might have had? So for me, the book was also a way of thinking about things that had preoccupied me for a very long time. One is, for instance, uh, an ethical question. How do we share this planet with uh, other species? How do we communicate among species if that's possible? I believe it's possible. This might be totally unscientific. And uh, also, how do we uh, perform some kind of equity in the way in which we share our terrain with other species? This comes out of many years of being troubled by the logic that we now recognize as the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene. I mean, this expansionist greed that has led us to develop ever more complex systems that require ever more resources and the way in which we treat the entire ecology as some inexhaustible repository uh, with many, many results which we're all familiar with. But for me, what's, what sees my imagination and if you will, my affect is uh, the effect it's had on, on, uh, on, on uh, other species in terms of extinctions, endings, uh, loss of habitat, and so on. So this was certainly very much in play for me. Along with that went a, a preoccupation that I have as a poet and as a translator with the ways in which languages are endangered by the cultural aspect of this same phenomenon. Uh, what does it mean to be the last speaker of a language? What does it mean to have a text before you as a reader that you really can't even read because there's no one left to decipher it? So that's another set of questions that, that came into play. And uh, that's the, the poem that actually started it off for me is a poem called Gulf Doctor. Okay. It's, uh, it, it, I, I'm happy to read it. I mean, it was, I was walking on the, on this, on the shore road, the Corniche in Doha, actually. And uh, it was a very peculiar moment because I felt I was at home in Bombay, working on Marine Rive. But actually, I was, like, I was in a mirror image city. I was in Doha on the other side of the Arabian Sea, looking back at the ocean that I've always known from, from one perspective. And it just set loose uh, a number of sensations of being displaced, of, of being at bay, if you will, literally. So I'm going to read the poem, and then we can speak more. And it's dedicated to a friend uh, and colleague, Abdullah Karoum, who's a curator. And we were actually working together on a project when I wrote this poem. Uh, he's director of the Mathaf Museum in Doha. So I was curating an exhibition of M.F. Hossein, a retrospective scale exhibition. So thoughts of exile, of straddling oceans, all of these were very prominent for me at this point. Gulf Nocturne for Abdullah Karoum. A shoal of cresting neon drum beats furrows through the tide. The moon hovers above a vacant plastic chair that the ziggurat on the far shore will shove aside. The wind beats down every veil and flag in sight. The sea shakes off its turquoise sleep and bounds foaming up the crumbling steps to snatch a biscuit from your hand as waves, as particles, 
words that flash and whirl around a darkened tower? In what crumpled atlas, what book of spells, how will they recall us? As scattershot signals, as shards of a sentence that broke under the planet it carried? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Ranjit. Um, I was also, um, you know, particularly struck by the opening poem, um, Siddhi Mubarak Bombay, which is in the voice of a man born into a Southeast African community and captured later uh, by his Arab slavers uh, who sell him to a merchant in Bombay, a city whose name he eventually takes on. And after his emancipation, he returns to Zanzibar and the poem actually opens with a line, I should go home now, but I forget where that is. Please tell us a bit about the writing of this very remarkable uh, story poem, which is also a history of Bombay in some ways. And uh, please read it to us also. Sure. Thank you again for flagging this figure who, in some sense, opens the book and opens the book also in the gesture of the prose poem. Because one of the experiments in this book was to experiment with the ways in which we move between prose and poetry and how it's a certain kind of cadence that carries us through and how while we speak we actually speak in multiple languages even if it appears that we're speaking one or hence also our title this evening of language and languages so i'll say more about that after i've read the poem but about Siddhi mubarak bombay he's a figure who's been with me for a very long time because uh, i've been fascinated by the stories that we tell ourselves in Bombay, but more by the stories we don't tell ourselves. You know, for the longest time, Bombay's self-image was that of the great commercial capital built on cotton and the textile trade. So we saw ourselves as a cotton city. This lasted till the, the early 1980s and after the mill strike, that's all gradually gone into the realm of nostalgia. It took us much longer and through the research of scholars uh, working on this to recognize that we'd also been an opium city. That many of the fortunes of the key families in Bombay were built on opium. And the trade that connected uh, central India to Ahmedabad and Bombay and out to China. So it's, it's a sinister history, it's a tragic history, but we've come to terms with that in some sense. But what has not yet been thought about much is the role that Bombay played in some ways uh, in the slave trade. It's, in, it's one of the most horrific forms of commerce ever devised. It's utterly brutal and inhuman. And, but when we talk about it, we tend to usually think of the Atlantic side of the operation. We think about the, connect, the middle passage, the connection between West Africa and uh, the south of the US and the Caribbean and South America. But we don't always think about what role we here in India played uh, as part of that same large system. So uh, as you see, this concern continues for me from what went into Jonah Whale. So Siddhi Mubarak Bombay was in fact born on the east coast of Africa and was brought here. It's a 19th century story, so it's not that long ago either. So he's brought to Bombay, he grows up there, he, he's then manumitted as it were, his, uh, his owner sets him free. Then he goes back and starts an incredible second life as an expert guide to all of these Victorian discoverers. Uh, the Victorians were great at discovering things that the rest of us knew were already there. So, you know, whether it's Stanley Morton or Livingston or Burton, uh, it was uh, Sidi Mubarak Bombay who accompanied them and led them to the source of the Nile, for instance. So it's for me a study in how someone coming from a place of extreme vulnerability yet was able to reshape his life, assume some kind of agency over his own destiny and to straddle multiple continents, multiple languages and multiple destinies. So should I maybe read the poem and yes. then we talk more about it? Yeah. I might want to say a thing or two about the language of the poem, but we'll do that. Siddhi Mubarak, Bombay, 1820 to 1885, those were his years. I should go home now, but I forget where that is. A child, I was sold for a length of cotton 
and hammered into a link in a chain of caravans, taken across the sea in a dhow. The Arab slavers had been generous with the whip. The Gujarati merchant who bought me had a sense of humor. He called me Mubarak, blessed. Many years I worked for him in Bombay, city of opium warehouses, city of cotton go-downs, city of spice stores, city of jahazis, munshis, kalasis, sarafs, bishtis, sepoys. That was the only family I knew. So I called myself Bombay. My seat died, leaving instructions that I was to be freed. I went back to Zanzibar and built a house. In Bombay, I was a Siddhi, a man from the Zanj, a man the color of night. In Zanzibar, I spoke Gujarati, Hindustani, two words of English, stuttered in Kiswahili. But this new old country spoke to me in rhymes of soil, sand, river, jungle. It brought me gold, coral, also pearls. Speak, Sahib, Bwana speak wanted me to be his guide. Then Burton Sahib came, Buana Burton, then Buana Stanley. Buana Speak was looking for the source of the Nile. So were they all. I was their compass and their sextant. With them, I looked for the source of the Nile. Once we nearly died, as if the journey was cursed. Burton Sahib vomiting all the time. Buana speak, going blind, his eyes gummy and swollen with too much dreaming. At last, Ujiji, the lake rippled from one end of the world to the other, wide as a sea cradled in a giant's palm. God forgive us, we tried to cross it. Buana speak, lost his hearing. A beetle had crawled into his ear. What Afrit possessed him, I don't know, but he tried to get it out with a knife. No boats large enough to cross that lake. Later, I crossed Africa from coast to coast, walked more than any other man alive, logged 6,000 miles, most of it on foot. Match that if you can. Sometimes donkeys. Long after I left Bombay and went back to Zanzibar, its smells followed me. Freshly chopped garlic, fenugreek, king, pepper, cinnamon, bombil drying in a sharp wind. Bombil, I would say to myself, sitting on my stoop, looking across the sea, rolling the syllables in my mouth. Bombil, surmai, bangla, ravas. The masala thick pungency of one fish after another, after another would settle on my tongue. My neighbors must have thought I was chanting spells. Thank you, Ren. Lovely Thank listening. You. Thank you. Um, did you want to say something more about the poem before we uh, move on? Yeah, just a few things. One is, uh, one is that for me it became a sort of limited kind of demarcated field to allow various kinds of languages and registers to come into play. You'll see that, you know, we often talk about first language interference. I mean, linguists are, and I actually studied linguistics for my sins. Linguists are fond of uh, these rather formal sounding, very scientific notions. Uh, but I was, I wanted to see how a person with multiple first languages might have interference across all of them. So there are times when, I mean, I use, I, I'd use, turns of phrase that really are modeled on something you might say in Hindi, like he says two words of English, somewhere, you know, things like that, things you might not actually say in English. So there's that. Also how he moves between different forms of address. He starts by referring to some of these explorers as Sahib uh, in the Indian manner to which he's accustomed, but then switches to Buana. So I also wanted, a, wanted this to be, uh, as you voice it, you're also going across his languages and his uh, locations. So I just wanted to do that in as bodied and voiced a way as possible. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
Yeah. Uh, so this kind of leads me uh, quite uh, naturally to the next uh, question I had in mind. So we, uh, I think all of us here know of your work um, as a translator and of your interest in many languages, right? And uh, how does this, uh, your multilingualism, the fact that you really think and work outside a single language box, um, inform and enrich your work. I mean, you've already spoken about it in the context of uh, Sidney Mubarak, but if there is uh, something else that you'd like to uh, say uh, and reflect on your work or read some of your other poems. Uh, sure, no, happy to do that. I've said this often enough, it's part of my, my politics, if you will, but I've, uh, I've, I find the insistence of a, on a single language extremely dangerous whether that's in terms of some single national language that you want to impose on anyone. Was it yesterday or the day before? There was some absurd notification in a Delhi hospital that the nurses were to be forbidden from speaking Malayalam. Malayalam. Yes. Uh, so seriously, why? I thought that was an Indian language. But in any case, this is where you get. You, you begin to stigmatize and then you want to annihilate people on the basis of their speaking some language that's not yours. Uh, and to try these absurd highly modern, by the way, experiments in a multilingual situation like ours is truly absurd. In fact, you should be doing what we've done for centuries, which is that everybody or most people speak multiple languages or multiple registers of a language. So that's part of my politics generally, and I've spoken about it many times, so I won't do that here. But uh, because I grew up multilingually, <clears throat> I was never really comfortable with the sort of language politics that dominated Anglophone poetry in India for a long time. And I was, I've been part of that. And you know, it's just something that over the years you realize it was a, a, you know, a kind of waste of time. Because especially in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, many of us were defensive about the nativist attack on, you know, why are you writing in English? It's a colonial language. It's all of this nonsense. We've heard this many times. So unfortunately, many of us responded to that by being defensive about the use of English and to a great extent, I think, trying to refine it in a way that kept other languages out, often doing great damage to ourselves, I think. So over the years, what's, what's been crucial to me is an opening up and an acceptance of this multilingual fact and to see where that might take us. How might one open up one's own language? Uh, it can be done in different ways. I mean, either you import other languages directly and then you work in a certain kind of linguistic medley or the echoes or cadences of other languages. I mean, there are many different strategies and I think it's interesting to, to, to work with these possibilities. And that's where I think uh, my practice as a translator has become for me more and more important as, as, uh, as a way of arriving at my own poems. And I... And I see how that worked, for instance, uh, for a poet like Paul Celan, the German poet. Who, I mean, I'm, I, I feel very, very close to, to his work. I always have, but I've, I realize I haven't acknowledged it enough over the years. What does it mean to, to work across languages and allow, to allow the impress of one to fall on the other? How do you really recraft and reinvent your own languages through your other? languages these these have been crucial questions for me in the last few years particularly so i might actually read one or two poems i get the feeling that i'm falling into my cultural theorist no, no, habits of yeah. babbling more theoretically than than i need to hear in this assembly of friends so let me read one or two poems and then just annotate how this plays out okay this one's called glove It was, it's, it's something that I want to say actually happened. I mean, it really actually happened. It was an early morning at an airport and this happened at many levels. Glove, not a light headed dove, not a plastic bag, that hand floating in the air, rising on a gust, gliding to the tarmac. Is the glove a baggage handler slipped off? with her name tag and form. We're returning these goods. Weapons can't slash her. Fire can't scorch her. To sky and earth. Keep them, she says. I look around for someone else to be. And uh, 
You know, it's, uh, it's happened to all of us. Lines, verses just float into your consciousness and attach themselves to very, very mundane, ordinary things. And as it happens, it was a verse from the Bhagavad Gita that, that attached itself in my mind to this floating glove at the 6 a.m. You know, it was an airport scenario. So when I say weapons can't slash her, fire can't scorch her here, it actually is the verse from the second chapter of the Gita that some of you, many of you are probably familiar with. Nainam chindan tishastrani, nainam dahati pavaka, na chainam kledayantyapo, na shoshayati maruta. So if I annotate this, those who probably didn't recognize it would see that it's there. If not, for me, it's just part of the texture of how I think and articulate myself. So I thought I would maybe just put that out there. Then there's something that I've increasingly tried to break the wall between is what I, my life as a listener to music and what I write as a poet. So there's a Nirguni Bhajan which inhabits this poem which I'm going to read, called Mask. The fire spreads from mouth to cup, eye to spur its tracking, ear to storm that's drumming through cloud wreaths, rumor glistens then drips from leaf to leaf. Behind the severe, a peacock dances on an orange tree, its branches withering in the gale, he hears it whistle and whir and grits his teeth. His eyes remain trained on a golden deer that prances from one burning forest to the next. It's forgotten the voice that said, don't set foot in the third forest. It cannot escape the flaming musk it carries. So for me, that line, don't set foot in in the third forest is, is, is you know, I, when I say it, I hear Kumarji's voice, you know, PJ Banapaganai Dharana. So this is the way I think for me, uh, uh, the experiments, particularly in this book have gone, how to bear witness to the different voices that inhabit your mind and your consciousness and your imagination. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Ranjit. So um, sort of a related uh, question again. Um, so one can't really speak of languages, obviously, without, uh, you know, uh, speaking of colonialism, of power, unequal. Uh, I mean, you just spoke about uh, uh, this whole thing of banning nurses from speaking Malayalam, right? Uh, that kind of uh, power equations and so on. Uh, and so many languages and ways of being, ways of living and thinking are uh, actually disappearing or they're being made to disappear. So your poem, Lemuria, for instance, uh, written in memory of Susan Hiller, speaks to that. Uh, to the brutal histories of colonialism and what it does to people and to languages. The poem actually begins with that uh, very ironic invitation, be my guest. And the speaker in the first section of the poem tells the colonized people, tell him you want it back, your voice, every one of your voices. You know that sound has no frame. And woven into the poem are Marinowski and uh, Susan Hiller herself. <laughs> yes. uh, you refer here to the latter's very powerful work, the last uh, silent movie, featuring the voices of the last speakers of endangered extinct languages drawn from um, audio archives. So I was wondering if you could talk a little, a little bit about this interest you have in questions of power and language is also about the poem Lemuria itself. Sure, thank you. Uh, I've always been, uh, in some sense, fascinated by these questions, partly because I grew up, as I said, multilingual. So the hits and misses, the deficits and the advantages of, of the colonial encounter was very, very clear to me in, as I say, literally in a bodied way. Was, uh, not unaware of the privilege of, of having English and having had it for many, many generations. But I was also aware that as I was growing up, as the as previous generations passed on, I knew that we were losing archives from other languages, other kinds of experience. Uh, I also had a, I mean, increasingly an ambivalent relationship because to, to English, because it's a language I speak naturally as a first language. It's a language that's been in the family really since the end of the 18th century. So I have personally no sense of anxiety about it, but I'm very aware of how it's a language of power and how having it or not having it is the difference between uh, 
getting ahead or remaining where you are or worse. So it's so it's a, it's a question of being able to have access to and fully enjoy a language and its resources whilst being aware of where it stands in a more complex landscape of power and of privilege and of asymmetry. And uh, with Lemuria, I mean, that, that's a poem I've been working on in some sense for a long time because I've loved Susan Hiller's work for years and years. And I saw this, the work that we'll see a clip from, the last silent movie, which is really a video installation. Uh, it's, maybe we can have the clip and then I'll say more about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll share, share my screen. Thanks so much for that. Bye. We have a musical interlude. So Lemuria, as you saw, what, what, this, what the last silent movie is, is really an installation where uh, there's a, it's kind of a segment of an old style movie hall. You take your seat and then you see this projection, which is completely without image. The screen is absolutely black and you only have the subtitles and you have the audio. And every single sentence or set of sentences or conversation there comes from a language that's extinct or endangered. And you, there's a little uh, note there that tells you how many speakers of this language exist if they still do. So it's an extraordinary meditation on the end of languages and the destruction of the environments and the ecosystems that sustain the speakers of those languages. So in a sense, it's an extended elegy for what global capital and industrialization have done to vulnerable populations, particularly. So this is a work that I've returned to. I saw it first in Berlin in 2008, and then I've seen it uh, every now and again at museums or uh, large scale exhibitions. And it's, it stayed with me, and I really wanted to work on this for a long time. And Lemuria has fascinated me out of another part of my, uh, I, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm speaking to lots of people who live in Chennai. This is part of my Chennai connection, actually. Uh, my great, two of my great grand uncles were in the circle around Annie Besant, uh, Besant, but she insisted that her surname be pronounced Besant. And when Krishnamurti then went off to found the Order of the Star, well, dropped out of the Order of the Star and went out to become independent, they went with him. But thanks to this connection, I've inherited a, a connection to theosophy. And Lemuria, as those of you familiar with theosophical lore might know, uh, is one of the seven root continents that, uh, that theosophy believes have come into existence, some are yet in the future. So Lemuria for me was a, was a, a, a trope of imagination for a very long time. It's from childhood onwards, uh, the idea of a lost continent, something where a previous 
human adventure had been staged and taken place, somehow lost. Then later growing up, I realized that it had also played a role in uh, uh, one strand of Dravidianist politics, uh, the, the idea of a lost, now submerged homeland from which to counteract North-based politics of culture and identity. So for all these reasons in, the, in this poem, I'm thinking about some way of thinking about the global South, uh, communities that have been rendered powerless, whose voice or voices have been taken away, and to see how that plays out. So that's some of the backstories of, of the poem. And of course, there's, there are, uh, the, uh, cultural anthropology has, for me, been a very uh, useful way of thinking about these questions. So, Malinowski, for instance, or Gregory Bateson, Clifford Geertz, these have been thinkers who've been with me for the longest time in thinking about how we stand in the face of the strange or the other and how we bear witness to it or violate it or embrace it. Do you want to read, read us the poem now, uh, Ranjit? I, I certainly could do that, yeah. yeah. Shall I read the first... Uh, the first part then. Yes. Because it's yes. in multiple parts. Yeah. yeah. Right. So Lemuria in memoriam Susan Hiller. Be my guest. You were slow. You came late to the game. Spears and spells were no use against artillery shells. All you had were brittle, broken bones, once cushioned by flesh, now flutes. Your folded Tissues of air, dried bark, silk water, taken away, locked in vault or vitrine. Your echoes hung behind glass. And the world big cocoon of your hearing, trapped in the scratchy whining plate that the explorer's needle jabs to start. Tell him you want it back. Your voice, every one of your voices, you know that sound has no frame. Okay. Um, so just to sort of uh, maybe switch gears a little, a uh, little bit. Some of the poems uh, in Hunch Prose I really love for their very distinct uh, cadence. It's just the sound. You, know, you play with voices, with how. Uh, different speakers speak. I was thinking of uh, your poem, Man with Parrots, for instance, and I really am uh, especially fond of the last two lines and of how they sound. I was also struck by the rhythm of uh, protest, uh, your poem for uh, Patwardhan. Right. And I was wondering if you would care to read these poems or any others of yours that you... Sure. I don't know. Happy to read these poems, actually. This one's called Man with Parrots. A man with two caged parrots waits for a megaphone to screech. He is flying out of a monsoon. He will land where it never rains. The man does not belong to himself. He did not script himself. He is the residue of his fingerprints. He is who his iris says he is. He has been recorded as a wavering image, opening and closing his mouth in ritual sequences that suggest speech. He has been waved through. No one speaks to him. He drags his minefield around with him, clearing a track through safe zones. He does not know that the sun will burn through his skin as he builds a pyramid in which they will show images of people like him building pyramids as the sun burns through their skin. Not jinn, not ghoul. He is scan, he is quota, he is number. He won't feel the rain on his skin for three years. He will have nowhere to go. Thank you. In the uh, book, it follows from Siddhi Mubarak Bombay, actually. So I was also thinking, and as in fact, I do think through the book, about forms of uh, slavery, indenture, as is evident, this protagonist is someone who is intimately familiar to many of us, someone who seeks work in the Gulf. So 
John Novell also had those figures. It had slaves, it had Girmetias, indentured labor, transcontinentally displaced. And uh, also through this book, uh, I was, uh, my first degree, by the way, was in political science. So questions of equity and uh, uh, justice have long been with me. So they also informed these, the figures that show up here, the lion, the lion tamer, the trapeze artist, the ringmaster. So these questions of power and how it flows are also part of this. And indeed the other poem that you, you flagged, Srilatha, it's for my dear old friend, the painter Sudhir Patwardhan. Although not based in fact on any one painting of his, it's, uh, it's more a way of uh, paying homage to his great work of the 70s and 80s, which had a lot to do with the working class, with labor and its conditions. And I found myself increasingly thinking about the hand in Sudhir's paintings, particularly of that period, the grip, the hand, the hand as, it's also a, it's an old preoccupation for anthropologists, the mark of the hand, how does it make, how does it assert human presence? So protest for Sudhir Patwardhan. Hand at the gate, fist around the stone, hand on the placard, fist around the stone, Hand around the flagpole, fist around the stone. Hand around the baton, fist around the stone. Grip the flint edge, clarity of breath ebbing from stone. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for that. Um, uh, so I was also struck by, I think it was in one of your interviews uh, to Chintan in the Hindustan Times by what you said, and uh, I'm just going to quote you from that interview. Uh, you said, rational inquiry alone is not going to help us. We must learn to respond with all our faculties of instinct and intuition, bringing long lost forms of sensory attention back into play, evolving new forms of empathy and mutuality. And then I started to actually flip through the poems in Hunch Prose um, at random, looking for the sensory uh, that there was, and I found so much, uh, you know, the opening lines from Gulf Nocturne, which you read already, um, or these lines from Homer, he had been trying to catch the late haze of sun on the retreating tide, the sourness of plum on a sailor's tongue, or even that uh, striking image from Ivory Bird, legs pulled in, lock, neck, head, beak, and side pointed. Um, so could you read to us, um, you've already read Gulf Norton, but uh, maybe Homer, uh, perhaps an extract, and also, um, you know, uh, Ivory Bird. Um, just poems that um, illustrate uh, what you have said about the importance of sensory attention over rational inquiry. Okay, not over in the sense of a binary it's, uh, for me, it's not an either or, but I'll, I'll read and then I'll come to that question. Because uh, uh, amazingly, telepathically, I was going to say something about that in relation to some of the earlier poems, but we'll hold that. I'll just read the poems and then we'll come back to these questions. This one's called Ivory Bird, Hole of Fells. It's actually one of the, it's a, it's a Stone Age cave in the south of Germany where, uh, where we found, right, I think, some of the earliest objects ever made by human hands. Nothing in the world except the rasp of ads, the scrape of gauge against the gutted mammoth's tusk until your cup, cream ridged into feathers, wings folded back, legs pulled in long, neck, head, beak, a missile pointed at water far below, or the clouds, the first cormorant ever sculpted in the sky of your palm. That's Ivory Bird, and I'll read Homer. Homer. What was his crime? Tell them at home he was taken hostage by his own fictions trapped by the snake-haired girl who froze her neighbors, or waylaid by the one-eyed clown who heard, hurled rocks at the sea, say he did all he could to save his sailors from getting their snouts in the cat woman's trough. A schooner snags on the burning horizon, a winning horse breaks the slate line between surf and rain. 
The voices he'd known crimsoned up as one wave. He thought he'd go blind among the lamp shadows flickering on the cave wall, ran out to the wharf. Eyes on the sand, he crosses the currents to where a girl sits on a bench playing a flute. He'd been trying to catch the late haze of sun on the retreating tide, the sourness of plum on a sailor's tongue, the ache of waiting for a boat almost killed him. Wasn't enough to craft a coral shield, a quiver of stings. He will grout himself together from wind, rock, foam, and this island whose name he doesn't yet know. He's been strapped to the mast for his own good. Tell them no one is safe from the hurricane of the story. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have, I think, a few more minutes for questions and then we will, uh, we'll sort of open it up to audience questions after that. Sure. Um, yeah, so let me uh, talk about, uh, you know, let's talk about your uh, sources, uh, you know, what kinds of material and primary sources, resources you find yourself sure. most drawn to, you know, many of the poems in your collection uh, have very extensive end notes, which are like a door <laughs> and into the poems. Uh, and it's like, it's like another language, a complimentary, uh, uh, something that complements the language of your poems, yeah, I think, you know, but yeah. So I wonder if you'd like to talk about that a bit. Sure, sure. I actually love writing endnotes. And again, this is, you know, in the spirit of how in Jonah Whale and in this book and going forward, I've tried to break down walls I had created myself among the different things I do. So for many, many years, decades, in fact, I kept my scholarly writing and my poetry more or less separate in terms of its form. And at some point in the last few years, I thought to myself, why am I doing this? I actually enjoy writing endnotes when I write papers and essays. And there uh, seems no good reason to not import that here and see what role that can play. And to do that in a way that's helpful to readers, but playful, and just allows you to explore other kinds of tonalities. So I did that in Jonah Whale. I've done that here. It may not happen that I do it again in another book, but it's just been... As you said, Srilata, thank you for that response. It's also intended to set up a kind of interplay between the language of the poems and the language of the, of, of, of the notes. But what I draw on, as you've already noticed in some of the poems I've read, I draw on uh, the disciplines that I work with and I draw and I'm sustained by in my other work, in cultural theory or in art, certainly in anthropology, certainly in archaeology. I mean, the last poem in the book uh, actually even quotes from the earliest evidence of writing in human history, the, the Ugarit uh, clay tablets. So to me, it's, it's a way of thinking about ourselves as complex linguistic subjectivities. How is it that we inhabit different languages, different tenses, if you will, different forms of using language? And that helps me look back to something you asked uh, uh, some some minutes ago uh, about this question of rationality versus sensory. To me, it's yeah. not a versus. I think what has happened if we place this historically is that there has been, um, I, I hope the scientists here will forgive me for saying this, there has been a, a, a valorization of a positivist way of looking at the world. It's a, it goes, we all know this. It goes back to Descartes. It goes back to the Enlightenment where the human individual sovereign subject is placed over against all the rest of nature, which is to be explored, studied, uh, classified, and used. Yeah? So when this kind of positivist, seemingly abstract scientific logic is linked to an expansionist, aggregationist logic of commerce and of, and of political control, it becomes one of the legitimizing devices for the destruction of the planet, really. So, and it also sets up within us, as we all know, a certain division between mind and the senses, mind and body. And there are disciplines, music, for instance, or dance or theater, where this distinction is sought to be broken down. So for me, writing a certain kind of poetry, which, is, which appears primarily in print and sometimes performatively as now, it was important for me to reclaim some of these resources. 
what might it be to be a poet in a theater? What might it be a, like to be a poet uh, writing in a musical context? What might it be, uh, for instance, as I did, for a poet to write a libretto for an opera? I worked for a number of years with Vanraj Bhartia, and we, we produced a libretto for an opera based on a Girish Karnad play. So it's also a way of thinking about poetry outside of a, rel a relatively narrow kind of place where it seems to have found itself. Not in a page versus stage, spoken word versus printed word kind of way, but to reclaim the much, much larger and much older history of poetry in song, in theater, in ritual, in performance, where all of your body, all of your sensory apparatus comes into play. Uh, also, I have synesthesia. So from childhood onward, which I thought was a common thing and I assumed everybody had it. Only when I grew up did I realize that very few people have it. So this crossing from one sense to another, taking in the stimuli of one sense and experiencing them in another is actually to me, uh, uh, it is how I experience things. So that's also informed this other preoccupation of mine. Yeah, I already see questions in the chat box, but uh, maybe very quickly, just one last question and a couple of poems that you would like to read and we'll open it up for questions, Ranjit. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it seems to me and I think perhaps to a lot of readers also uh, that there is a, a kind of a spiritual heart that beats through uh, this collection, Hunch Prose. And uh, I'm also aware uh, of your interest and engagement with uh, Kabir and uh, Ghalib. Um, so are there poems in this collection that speak to your love for Kabir and Ghalib that come from broadly the same uh, place, the same structures of feeling, if you will? And if you could read that maybe as a way of, you know? Sure, I could. Uh... Yeah, there is a, I don't know if it's for me to say, thank you for noticing that and for flagging it, but for me it's uh, questions of uh, how one might achieve some sort of communion or solidarity with others whilst yet writing something that is in the tradition of the short lyric or how might one achieve communion with something that lies outside of oneself? This greater sense, perhaps the sublime, and if each, each of it would characterize it in different ways uh, without falling into mystical mumbo jumbo. I think there are ways in which all of us in our different practices come to that point of enigma or aporia or uh, the sublime. It, for some of you that might happen with a genome sequence, with uh, an equation, with the you know, snapshot of a certain kind of theory, with words that get to the horizon of something you can't put into words. I think we've all had those experiences. So in some sense, I wanted to go to that edge and bear witness to what that feels like. So definitely. So the preoccupation with Laldeed, Kabir and so on speaks to that. Ghaleb is a different part of my life. That is the part that has to do with this poet who was uh, political figure, a survivor, who was ironic and playful, uh, who was a troubled soul, but who really was one of the modernists. And I've, again, I've said this before, but I'll say it once more. It's, I, I'm always startled at the way in which people put Ghalib in some box of his own without recognizing that he was actually the, the contemporary of Baudelaire, of Whitman, of Heinrich Heine. So I would really see him as part of this larger global 19th century breakthrough into a certain kind of, if you will, modernist consciousness, which was able to wrestle both with a rational positivist set of questions and questions that couldn't be answered through scientific means. More mystical questions, if you will, uh, more sensuously apprehensible questions. So I'm going to I'm going to maybe read a poem where I do actually have Ghalib coming into play. And then we could go into questions. This is called Ape. Ape. The key body part can be downloaded on demand. Tear the banner. Don the shroud. Try making a man, Ghalib says out loud. Let him walk blindfold on a gunpowder track that snakes through a crowd. One last suture to get this buttonholed skin in shape. Try making a man of the speaking ape. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. So I think we really have to open up for questions. Thank you so much, Ranjit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, because I think I already see a couple of questions here, and uh, yeah. some of you, if you still want to put in questions, please do that. Um, would you like me to read those questions to you? Yes, please. That yeah. Would help. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, here's Ashwin, and I think this is a question that you. Uh, didn't want me to ask you, but well, he's asking it of you. Which he is, says, I would love to know more about the title Hunch Pros. Also more about <laughs> the choice. <laughs> There's no escaping that. No. The choice of compound but titles of Hunch Pros and Jonah Wayne. Ah, okay. Uh, hmm. No, you're right. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want, want that question to come up only because, um, you know, I've answered the question before. I mean, you, you, I mean, those of you who have read the book, you know, the poem. It's, uh, it's a playful poem. But it uh, sets up this, this kind of mock rivalry between uh, a figure who represents the poet and, other f and then on the other side is someone who might be a fiction writer, might be a reporter, might be someone who does nonfiction. So it's really a question about the play. I mean, the poem plays out the, the competition, if you will, between poetry and other forms of articulation and why poetry could or should claim its place in a public forum or simply in terms of addressing our key human urgencies. But I don't want that to sound like, you know, a poet whining about, oh, why isn't poetry taking seriously and it doesn't have readers and all of this tosh. Honestly, I don't think you can sort, sort out questions of how important a discipline is based on some kind of demographic survey. So that's not what it's about. It's more a question of thinking about how one might renovate poetry, how one might continually break it open and remake it, and how one might be aware and take heart from something that Malame wrote a long time ago, which is that there is no such thing as prose. There's only verse that moves at different speeds. I'm paraphrasing crudely, but you'll, you'll find this sentence somewhere in his writings. So that was my, that's my question. It's really about not seeking validation for poetry, but if anything, urging poetry to take on challenges that it seems to have delegated happily to other forms of articulation. So that's the, that's the answer. So uh, here's this other, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, the question of the compound names. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for one thing, I love compound words. It's one of the things that I early on began to that's 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 one of the things one of the features of german that i that i fell in love with when i first learned the language a long long time ago it's rusty now but it's still present to me in many ways uh yeah the way in or in sanskrit again the ways in which you can bring words together not in a limited portmanteau mechanical way but in a way that each illuminates the other so jonah will which for arcane reasons, many, many people in India think is Jonah Wale. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment too. So Jonah whale for me is a way of saying that Jonah and the whale are not two separate things, not two separate entities. Uh, the victim or survivor or pilgrim is within the system. Jonah and the whale are two parts of the same, of the same larger system. So that's, that's, something I wanted to think about as a cultural, as a political, and as a metaphysical kind of trope. And hunch prose again, some notion of what it might be to be seen as the ill-favored, ill-starred, you know, step, step sibling of prose. Uh, again, playfully rather than in, with any sense of lamentation. Yeah. So Ranjit, did you already, uh, hi Ranjit. Hi. Uh, so did you already have a title in mind as you were working on a manuscript or did it come to you later? No, it came, uh, Jonah Whale came to me at some point as, as the manuscript took place, uh, took shape. Uh, Hunch prose, not till much later actually in the process. I think for a long time, uh, Hunch prose was called the seed catalog, but that was just a placeholder. I, I knew that there would be another title, but it helped me think about the structure, particularly, or the, or the sequence of poems. Yeah. So why did you hone in on this particular title? Why did I hone in on it? Because it seemed to, uh, because there were, there were a number of different linked themes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt this actually spoke to a key image that I had in mind, which doesn't necessarily occur in the poems, which is the, 
<clears throat> ill-favored bell ringer who produces mm. this incredible music. So that was a working trope for me. Every, everything that is a working trope for me when I'm putting a book of poems together doesn't necessarily manifest itself. It's like a secret life of the book. Thanks. Thank you. May I speak? Indeed. Hi. Uh, Shabnam. Hi. Hi, Shabnam. Hi. Hi. Um, so I just uh, wrote a few notes down as you were speaking. If I'm permitted to share my comments, that's all right with you, uh, Sri Lata? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, clearly, what is exponentially beautiful about your poems is your very finely attuned uh, musical air and all your multilingual abilities that you bring, um, bring to your work. And I find at this particular moment, many aspects of our known world, um, to use a stark um, mathematical uh, metaphor, they're being reduced uh, to a zero, um, you know, mainly due to the contagion and uh, the environmental decay and all the ideological battles uh, that you, you refer to often. Um, but you navigate these poetically, all these absences, without compromising on the immediacy of the loss when you aestheticize your vision. And I find that uh, remarkable. Um, you also manage to infuse um, rhythm into emptiness um, when you impose a form and structure uh, onto the inspiration that triggers your poems. Um, so th those, those are my comments. And the question at the end of this is, um, is there a subliminal aspiration in your poetic utterance, uh, which seeks to invent or rather reinvent the sacred um, uh, to be an emissary of sorts? Um, and if not, uh, you should. <laughs> so. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you for your observations and for the question. I do, particularly in this book, I think I do feel like some kind of emissary between worlds, I want to say, but different kinds of domains. Uh, and I have, I have had a, a very long-term preoccupation with the sacred, but the sacred as it's embodied in the everyday which actually was the title of a large scale trans-historical exhibition I did some years ago called The Sacred Every Day. So to me, the sacred is not something that is somehow the monopoly of organized religion, quite the opposite. I think it's something that is come upon in unsuspected ways, unexpected places, and then offers some sort of uh, amplification, if you will, some ability to transcend one's limitations or constraints at, you know, different, two different degrees and at different levels. So that, that to me is a, and which allows for common ground, for communion, for solidarity. So I know that there will be people who won't see this as the sacred, but I see it as some kind of articulation of the sacred, yeah. Um, so Ranjit, there is, uh, sorry, uh, there's a question, uh, another question in the chat box. So maybe I'll just uh, sort of. Sure that out. Uh, this is unsure. And the question is, what does it mean uh, to read or write poetry in the midst of a pandemic? And prose focuses on labor, exile, and interspecies, interlingual worlds. How does one contemplate these while being limited by our surroundings? In other words, what is Ranjit's expectation of poetry? I have no single expectation of poetry. But to, to answer the question, actually, it is it's during wars and pandemics and all kinds of situations that stretch us to the extremity of our human possibilities and our human endurance. That precisely is when art and culture sustain us. I mean, I don't want to take a functionalist view and say this is the function of art or of culture, but th these are the things that carry us across. These are the things that take us through, whether it's, it's the reason why Susan Sontag went to Sarajevo, in the middle of a vicious genocidal civil war, to work with people there on a play. It's the reason why people turn to music, to concerts, even when you know, bombs are falling overhead. It's, uh, it, it's, act it's actually moments like this that demand from us that we assert ourselves as human beings and not fall down fatalistically and, and um, you know, 
So even as we are extending ourselves, or rather people are extending themselves on our behalf at the frontiers of science in dealing with this, uh, you know, we can't just be passengers on this, on this, on this flight. There's a responsibility that we need to take up in terms of sustaining ourselves and others, and culture plays a very crucial role there. Um, yeah, there's, there's another uh, question. Uh, Tess wants to know, when will Hunch Pros be available in the US? <laughs> I, uh, I really am not sure. I, I hope all works out, and if it does, then you will see it there. But meanwhile, Tess, I'm happy to send a copy across. Okay, just one, one question, Ranjit. I understand your poems are translated into other languages. Do you choose a translator? Uh, how do you ensure that translation is loyal to your works? Uh, meaning, is the how is the translation loyal to the original? Yes. Ah, okay. Like, unless you know all the other languages in which it is translated. Uh, sorry, meaning when I translate? No, no, when others translate. Others oh, when others translate me. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, 